Recovery Shared, your online source for all things recovery. Recovery Shared, your online source for all things recovery. My name is Justin Sims. I'm always joined alongside my co-host Michael Stone. Today, super, super special guest. Uh, a human weapon, but he also happens to be possibly, and don't hit me for this, a more impressive human being than a fighter. That's my, uh, that's my experience with the one and the only UFC fighter, survivor, legend in the making, Charles Rosa. Hey man, thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate thanks for it, being here. Thank you. Why I had such a difficult time with struggling with drug addiction and stuff like that is because, you know, I never wanted to give up. So there was, it was really difficult when they were like, you know, oh, you have to go to this meeting, you have to surrender, you have to, you know, give your power over to somebody else, you have to believe in all that stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm gonna fight this thing. I'm gonna fight this thing to the end. Like I'm, nothing's gonna beat me. Nothing's gonna beat me. But after seeing it beat my two older brothers who are the two toughest kids that I know like my two older brothers Dominic and Vincent or I would say the, the, the two toughest strongest like mentally strong physically strong like you know tough city kids that I ever met you'll ever come across yeah, you ever come across and it, it it killed both of them you know both my brothers Dominic and Vincent uh, overdosed and passed away when I was 16 and then the consecutive year when I was 17 so I was a sophomore in high school and then a junior, senior in high school when I lost my uh, other brother, Dominic, Vincent Dominic, and uh, man, like, you know, that's, that was like, kind of like in the, you know, the beginning to the middle of my drug addiction, but after that, I kind of, I think I just kind of used all the pain from that and I self-medicated, so mm -hmm. it made it way worse, but I already started when that kind of happened, so I was in the midst of it and it continuously got worse. And on top of it, you know, there's... There's uh there's like drugs drug deals and selling going on so you tie all this stuff in together and it just it makes just for for madness you a know dangerous lifestyle dangerous lifestyle I think like I don't make any excuses for why you know I did drugs or got bad or any of these type of things but I definitely know you know going back to what you said in the beginning I learned consequences from my actions at a young age you know when I was seven when I was 17 years old after my brother Dominic passed away I remember. Uh, they, they searched me at school and they found a little piece of like Suboxone, which isn't even like because I would spit it out so I could use drugs. Like Suboxone is basically a maintenance drug, so you can't use harder drugs like Oxycontin, Percocet, and heroin and stuff like that. And this is basically an opiate blocker. And uh, I would take it every morning, which it's an opiate blocker. I was supposed to take it every morning, but I would spit it out and put it in my pocket. So when they searched me at school, I had it in my pocket, and I don't even know why I had it in my pocket. I just must put it there. But when they searched me, they, they found it. I tried to jock it, but they took police game they made me shake out my pants and stuff like that and they what's this i'm like it's a tic tac and i <laughs> swear to god <laughs> it was the funniest thing because you think that's the most ridiculous thing you could say the principal was like oh it's tic tac it's a little orange he bought piece. it he bought it and the police officer was like a fuck it the fuck you take shut up like, I tic -tac. <laughs> oh, like you would think we're stupid kid and i'm like and they're like what is it because they couldn't tell because it was like i had it in my mouth and spit it out but anyways that's what eventually kind of got me um you know suspended and they sent me to a place called Bridgewater, Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Anybody from New England knows Bridgewater. It's a place where it's something called Section 35, where they can section you, which means that they can put you into basically jail. They basically put you in 30 days in jail without even being committed to no crime. charge. It's a civil commitment, so it's no charge on your record, but it's a civil commitment, and you go in jail with people that are criminals that are also there. So, and I was 17 years old, so you say, well, how did he go to an adult jail yeah. when you're 17? Well. Luckily, in my case, after my my two brothers passed away and the my dad knew the uh, goes to the judge, they took my special uh, case as a special case, and the judge can do whatever he wants. He said, "Hey, listen, this kid obviously is troubled. We're going to teach you a lesson. You know, after what happened to your brothers, man, and uh, at a very young age, 17, they took me out of high school and they put me into uh, basically jail with adults. I got accepted to uh, Johnson Wales Culinary School in Providence, Rhode Island, and I went there." for three years and uh, graduated from culinary school, you know, all under active addiction. But, uh, but you did it. Phase. Yeah, I did it. I did it, you know, and I think it's just because I just remember, like, even when I was on drugs and stuff like that, like, I knew that I had to do try my best. Like, it didn't change just because I was on drugs. Like, I still was going to do everything I had to do, you know, to get to get through. That mentality that your dad put in yeah. at an early yeah. age shined through substance, yeah. Yeah. even. But it, it, what drugs? Uh... Uh, main drugs was Oxycontin. That was like my my drug that I did from when I was fifteen Fucking years old. Fucking graduate, Colin. Just Fuck. like with this, 
that's like the story that goes through it's the same with most everybody uh, that you would think people would think Oxycontin is like you're gonna be fucking knotted out no. your whole life and right. if it was me I was look I was able to like graduating culinary school like fucking I had like I was able to build thousands of fucking websites on Oxy. Totally. Yeah. Never even took off work at I, all. Yeah, the, it's actually crazy you say that because I remember every time I would go to do a paper, like when I had to do a paper, I would not, I could not do the paper unless I got like drugs, you know? Like mm. that's the way it was and it was really messed up but like I just remember like it almost, it's, it's it gets so worse. messed up. Yeah, it, <laughs> like, oh, it gets worse, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm making like, yeah, you do drugs, it helps get yeah. you through school but it no, it, it's really, <laughs> I put me in a lot of really, really yeah. bad situations, and like, and I just got by by the skin of my teeth. That's really the truth of it. Like, it was just, I think a little bit of, and that's I had such bad luck when I was a kid, losing my brothers and stuff like that, things I couldn't control. That maybe they, they were watching over me and were able to guide me through that part of my life to get. I education. believe that. And I, I, that's what I believe. Like an angel just watching over me in those situations. Like I remember being on the highway driving to class one time and. Again, waking up to hitting off the side of an 18 wheeler off the highway, but I just I hit it and, and straightened out, and I was like, oh my god! And I just the guy pulled over. I pulled. He was like, you're right. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. My mirror got knocked off, and I was like, dude, I just hit it. I could have went under the 18 wheeler. That was wheel. death right that there. That was death. One second, I nodded off, boom, and I it was I was and I knew when I hit him that I was out. Like it wasn't like I just was like, boom, I was like sleeping, like so, dude, wow. like that woke me up that day a little bit, but it still didn't stop me, you know. And, so that's it after college you know one once college was done it was kind of like that phase like well now what do i do is like get a job like and i was like man i can make way more money selling drugs so that's when it got really bad i was making a ton of money selling drugs cocaine like anything that you could get like a lot of money like i had everything and this is like the moment that changed my life is for like about you know it was pretty much the summer because it was the summer so those three months I had a little beat I had my own little spot up in New Hampshire on the beach, like perfect spot. And but all I did is sat in my house and do drugs and sell drugs. But I thought I had everything I ever wanted in my life. I had all the drugs you could ask, every type of drug, like, you know, like pounds of weed, freaking coke, uh, everything. And I had, you know, I'd have girls be coming over to buy the stuff, so there was always girls around. I was in my own place. I was like, you know, I, I was the man I, I, I thought made it. I thought I had and I had tons of cash I had everything I always thought I ever wanted like money girls and respect from the people and doing what I want to do me. I do what I want to do I'm independent I have I graduated college like look at me I'm the man and you would think like that's that's what I thought was happiness for me I thought that was my moment of happiness and, and I remember this was like that moment that they say you have like a spiritual awakening mm. where things like was this I could say it was like magic for me like where things change I was un, and you know just I was really, really bad in addiction here. So at this point, I was probably doing, you know, five or six 80s a day, which if any one person took that, if, one per, if a normal person took one Oxycontin 80, they'd be dead. Yeah. I was at five or six a day at this point. And I walked into my house, walked up the stairs, went, and I looked in the mirror, and then I just didn't recognize myself. I could not even, like, I was like, who the, f like, who is that? Like, I couldn't even see myself. And so I had uh, a number that I called. I don't know if it was like on a card or someone told me, but I looked at this number and I called and uh, they were able to, because my parents at this point were like kind of done sending me to treatment centers or trying to help me and stuff like that because we went through that a lot in college. And, you know, I uh, had this number I called and was able to get myself into like a state, you know, facility. But it was that moment that like I had that spiritual awakening. Like I looked myself in the mirror and I didn't, I had everything I thought I wanted, the money, the girls, the respect, everything, and I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize myself, and I said, no. Like that illusion went away. Yeah, you it's saw your real self. It's fake. There's not, I don't have anything, you know? Yeah. And that day, I went to a place in New Hampshire. It was like in the middle of nowhere. They came and they picked me up. I didn't have any insurance and stuff, so I don't even know how it worked. You know, I don't even remember like the name of it or anything. And I was there for, for two days, and I remember finally after two days of being deathly sick like crying i was crying like a baby the next part is you know is is is, is what is is the positive part of the story like the, the the turnaround that was the moment my life flipped and i fell in love with mma instantly i didn't miss a class i went every single day rode my bike i didn't have a car at the time so i rode my bike from the rehab to the gym every day would ride home ride my bike to work 
ride home, wake up in the morning, and do that basically six, seven days a week. Like my off day, I was training. Like my Sunday that I didn't have to work or whatever day I had off of work, I trained twice that this day. This was your new drug. This is my life. This is my drug. This is everything. And you find yourself changing? Three like years. you find yourself oh, getting dude, better and like better, mentally? Better, stronger, friggin' more, more attention. Like everyone just, it was just my life got better and better. It didn't stop getting better. And then uh, that longest time, I was still going to the meetings, doing the right thing, helping people, being active. And from that moment, that I stopped doing drugs, I can honestly say, like, my life didn't stop, besides the eight months of treatment, which they tortured me, my life didn't stop getting better from that second that I walked in that MMA wow. gym, and it's still continued like that to this day, you know, I mean, yeah, you'll have bad days and good days or bad weeks, but overall, I saw my bank account would just continuously go up, and my happiness would continuously go up, and I just, like, everything just kept getting better and better. Every aspect and, of your life yeah, was upgraded. Yeah, everything was better. Like, you know, I've a lot of people and sponsors and things helped me along the way, and I'm super grateful for that. And But it all came stemming from doing the right thing, you know, helping people in the beginning, you know, doing the right thing. Like, and, you know, ever since, like I said, stopped doing drugs and, you know, start, and it wasn't just drugs. That's the thing people get confused about. It was, like, like my character traits. Like, I just, like... You know, with like, like stealing. Like, I, I, I'm not like a thief, really. I don't think I'm a thief, but like, I just noticed that every time I went into a store when I was in my active addiction, I would steal something. I don't know how I just end up with something. Like, even if it was a toothbrush from like, and I, that's the type of thing. So oh, even litter, I, I would throw food out the window. I wouldn't care. Litter, I would never think about anything like that. And these are things that the treatment center told me to stop doing. Like, you gotta stop lying. You gotta stop stealing. You gotta stop littering. You. And I was like, well, what? How do I know what I can and can't do? She goes, well, what stop? Let's start by not breaking the law. Let's follow the law first. And I was like, whoa. Like it's a that's good a good point. start. It's a good start. So that's yeah. how I started. Sure. And I built myself that I could build on my personality and my character defects and all these things. If you can teach a kid not to touch a stove when it's, you know, the, the consequences, you burn. Oh. When he's a kid, he was a baby. It's the first thing you learn. You touch something hot, boom. You don't do it again. You just know. Yeah. Don't touch a stove. Yeah. And that's what the kids have to learn. And the parents are the ones that have to teach them, though. It's education. And that's what... I think is the most important thing and what you just brought up. I think the education for the parents, which is the ripple effect to the kids and the whole, the whole thing is the most important thing. I think that's that's my solution for it. But, you know, I think there's a lot of things that have to go into it. And this so, is this is movie type of stuff in yeah. your life. And it's and it's and it's such an inspiring thing because you've built such a good life now that you're not willing to refund it for anything stupid. Yeah. No, you know, that's, that's what happens to us in recovery. We build such a good life yeah. that we're not gonna wanna turn it in for something yeah. dumb. And, 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 and yeah I mean that's that's what I've, I've learned is just like my life all these good things keep happening as long as I do the right thing and I'm, I'm confident in that and I believe that and that's what I tell people I still talk to kids call kids up like occasionally like some other fighters like, hey man my cousin's having a tough time can you maybe talk to him and I'd be like listen man the first thing I do is I just tell him to call me every day and I would say one out of <clears throat> 50 kids maybe not one out of 50 but like one out of 30 kids will be the one that calls me back every does day it. that does it and that one is the one that gets better sometimes you know and I've been able to help a few kids one of them actually just moved into my house my roommate my buddy Jose like he uh he was one of those kids that just kept calling back and I kept you know helping him the much I could I would take him to lunch take him caught him into jiu-jitsu he actually just won his first uh he just he's a he's a, he's a blue belt world champion in jiu-jitsu he just won a friggin he got him into jiu-jitsu and he's the kid's doing amazing he works at a treatment center he helps people and i don't take the credit for it but i think it's the same thing you helped you, spark uh, that just, though. Yeah, just, all you got to do is be able to kind of give them a little push or a little motivation that they didn't have and that could be the difference of of uh of making it or not making it living or dying the ripple effect of what you do is 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 huge man so Continue to be you. Continue to inspire. Nice. You're, our, you're our favorite UFC fighter. Nice. And I say hi. Hey, thanks for watching Recovery Shared. Please go to our About page on our channel and you'll find links to treatment centers that we've reviewed and recommend. Also on our About page, you'll find helpful links to traditional and non-traditional recovery help. Let's help each other together. We can help save a life.